As COVID-19 fears grow across the world, financial markets take major hits. How much impact will coronavirus have on the global economy? Hello, I'm Arnand Naidu and this is The Heat. Coronavirus continues to spread around the world. According to the World Health Organization, over 110,000 infections have been recorded and over 3,800 people have died. Italy has now extended its quarantine measures to include a ban on public gatherings for the entire country. Meanwhile, fears about the virus are having a big impact on financial markets from Asia to the United States. And on Monday, Wall Street saw its biggest one-day loss since the financial crisis back in 2008. Earlier at the White House, President Trump outlined some measures for business relief. We're going to be meeting with uh, House Republicans, Mitch McConnell, everybody, and discussing a possible payroll tax uh, cut or relief, substantial relief, very substantial relief. That's a big, that's a big number. Uh, we're also going to be talking about hourly wage earners getting uh, help so that they can uh, be in a position where they're not going to ever miss a paycheck. We're going to be working with uh, companies and small companies, large companies, a lot of companies, so that they don't uh, get penalized for something that's not their fault. It's not their fault. It's not our country's fault. Uh, this was something that we were thrown into, and we're going to handle it, and we have been handling it very well. Okay, let's get to our panel. Joining us now from New York is Anthony Chan. He is a former chief economist at J.P. Morgan Chase. Also with me here in the studio is Hafed al Goal. He is a senior fellow at Johns Hopkins University. Joining us from Beijing is Aina Tangen. He's a current affairs commentator for CGTN. And with us from Miami is Remy Pierre. He is a research associate on political economy and foreign policy at the Florida International University. Welcome to all of you. Anthony Chan, let me start with you. The New York Stock Exchange took a big hit today, another battering, closing more than 2,000 points down. The S&P 500 also taking a major hit. What's your assessment of what some are calling Black Monday? Well, I think that uh, right now the market has uh, quite a bit of uncertainty to deal with. But you got to remember that in a given year, the average uh, correction is about 14.5%. So we are still not even in a, in a real full-fledged uh, bear market. But clearly, there's going to be a hit to corporate profits. There's going to be a hit to economic growth. The market has to react, and it's, it's reacting appropriately. We've gotten some relief from the Federal Reserve, and now we may get some relief on the, on the fiscal side. So I'm uh, cautiously optimistic that... Uh, this is not going to be a prolonged uh, situation, but rather something that is transitory in nature. Anthony, we also hear some commentators and analysts talk about a correction in the market. Is this a correction? Well, it is by definition because a correction is defined as any declines above 10 percent and less than 20 percent. So by definitionally, it is a correction. And you can make the argument that that was potentially going to happen anyway, but we certainly have a catalyst now, and, and the catalyst is uh, increased uncertainty because even the medical experts uh, are, are telling us that they're not sure how long this is going to last. But if you look at every single virus going dating back to the Spanish flu, these things are typically uh, done and, and work themselves out in less than a year, so they don't last forever, and the market uh, at this point of uncertainty is almost pricing in. Uh, a situation where this is never going to end, and I don't think that's correct. All right, let me go to Miami, to Remy Pierre. Uh, Remy, deep concern in Europe as well, as we just reported. Italy has quarantined uh, large parts of the country, is now uh, saying that there'll be no gatherings throughout the country. The Prime Minister has called for a, quote, massive shock therapy. We heard a similar call being made in France as well. Uh, how deep is the market instability in Europe? Well, the impact of the coronavirus obviously is very strong in Europe because it's actually you know, attacking head-on the three largest economies of the, of, the, of the continent, which are, you know, France, Germany, and Italy. Uh, right now, the northern part of Italy, which is the most industrial part of the country, is under lockdown. Uh, so, obviously, it's going to be a very strong impact on, on the Italian economy. Uh, the Prime Minister of Italy has already mentioned the fact that he will actually, you know, try to support the economy by additional debt, an issue which has always been at the, at the center of, of Italian uh, hills in the in, in past because, 
Italy has experienced a large level of debt already throughout the last decade, so that's going to be strengthening uh, a structural issue with the Italian economy. But we potentially are just seeing the tip of the iceberg right now. Uh, th those countries haven't been hit still hard by, by, the, uh, by, by the pandemic. Um, and the impact of, of this will actually be decided by the capacity both of national uh, leaders but also the European Union to kind of support the, the economy by either decreasing the, uh, the rates on Thursday with the European Central Bank or also be able to dis discuss and, and decide some joint uh, initiative to try to sustain the economy. Uh, here, those three countries are very strongly hit, and they hit because specifically of the fact that Germany is a very a country very much geared towards exports, and therefore is, is really seeing very quickly the impact of the uh, of the pandemics because of this incapacity to export the goods that they usually do on the global economy. And in terms of Italy and France, I mean, the, the decrease of tourism, decrease of, of flights to the to the different uh, large uh, trade shows that are usually uh, happening in Western Europe at this time of the year have been mostly cancelled, and you're seeing a large impact in the short term, but potentially even larger in the long run. Hafid, we're also seeing one other big development, and that is oil prices have plunged. Uh, Saudi Arabia has uh, increased production. Yep. That's led to a spat with Russia. Uh, what's the connection here between the coronavirus outbreak and oil prices? Is it just decreased demand? Yeah, I, I mean, there isn't direct uh, uh, links right yeah. there. I mean, this is uh, sort of a spat between OPEC and Russia in which uh, Saudi Arabia wanted to, to, to make uh, deep cuts into the oil supply because of the, of, of the demand uh, um, or the glut in the market. Mm -hmm. Russia refused uh, and, and opposed that, even though it's not a part of OPEC. But, uh, and that sort of reached a point where Saudi Arabia is saying, OK, let's, let's take this to the limit. The issue here for Saudi Arabia is that uh, since there is already uh, uh, a big uh, uh, glut in the market, it's not really losing much by making these threats. However, its, it's debt, uh, the government debt, mm -hmm. is so large that, and it is so, it's predicated on a certain uh, high price of oil that I'm not sure it can go um, that deep into this kind of threat by reducing uh, uh, oil prices around the world with, with its oversupply threats. Mm -hmm. I think there is a limit to how far it can do it. So do you expect this will be resolved in the short term, that they'll both that, cut back on production? I think, because everybody's losing here. I mean, all those who are exporting oil are losing. The, the prices are plummeting uh, uh, with this oversupply. I don't see how anybody can sustain this in the long term um, unless we are looking at a whole new phase of, of the oil market in which OPEC breaks up and it becomes a free for all. Mm. Um, but I don't see a direct thing to, to the coronavirus. I think the coronavirus impact is largely in the tr um, trade, uh, international trade area and, and, and uh, supply chains mm -hmm. around the world. I mean, uh, the fact that China uh, closed a great deal of its factories mm. has a major impact. It's also reduced its demand on oil, for example. But to, to I, I, I think this situation we are dealing with, with Corona, is quite different economically from, let's say, the SAR uh, epidemic in 2003. Right. Um, and, the, and the weight of China in the market is, is different. I mean, in 2003, China's uh, percentage in world economy was about three to four percent today it's about 16 17 percent so anything that happens in China is has a major impact China has also become yeah. sort of the manuf manufacturing hub of the world mm -hmm. uh, and if it cannot supply even certain parts then everything gets affected around the world all right let's go to China we go to Anna Tangan who is in Beijing and uh, Anna uh, Asian markets have also spiraled this coronavirus crisis has also become an economic crisis uh, for China. Well, it's early Tuesday morning in Beijing right now. What's the outlook? Well, the outlook is actually fairly hopeful. I mean, uh, China's markets uh, did better than the, the rest of the world. We're talking about a 3% decline versus, uh, for instance, Saudi Arabia, 9%. Uh, London had its worst uh, day ever since 9-11. Uh, I'm going to uh, take a slightly different tack from some of the guests uh, and say that this is a very difficult time. Uh, already forward interest on the Dow is 200, uh, 200 points lower. 
Uh, you might expect a dead cat bounce, but the fact is we are headed into a recession. Uh, you can't have the three-point drop in the Indian uh, GDP economy, lowered expectations in China, uh, dismal expectations in, in Japan, which is going into official recession, uh, defined by two quarters of uh, downward um, uh, negative growth. Uh, Europe is in sad shape. The U.S. Uh, will see how strong the economy is. So, you know, we're uh, one percentage point down from a official bear market. Uh, it's time to face the realities that the supply chain has been interrupted, but also hospitality and travel. We're talking about tens, uh, t hundreds of thousands of jobs worldwide, and this will have an add-on kind of effect. Uh, and as far as the coronavirus infection itself is concerned, um, Aina, uh, China is reporting that there's been a massive decrease in the number of infections. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, I mean, it, almost all of the uh, cases, for instance, coming into Beijing have been foreigners coming into China. There have been really no uh, reported cases of, in, uh, of uh, coronavirus uh, expanding beyond Wuhan. So this is a very, very positive sign. It shows that uh, whatever China has done, it has been effective. Uh, some have criticized it for being aggressive, but it seems it got under control. The question right now is how do other countries respond, given that they have different structures and political uh, interests? How will they uh, react to this? The U.S. not looking very hopeful. Uh, there's kind of a passive aggressive approach by the administration. This is a witch hunt, but we're going to do economic things. Uh, it's a hoax, that type of thing, mm -hmm. uh, versus Europe, which is trying to struggle on how you take uh, its uh, union members and coordinate a, 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 some sort of policy. You can't just say Italy is going into quarantine because, quite frankly, uh, there are no restrictions across borders. People share trains and airplanes and cars every day going all around Europe. And if it's in one place, it will definitely show up in the rest. Remy Pierre, that's an important point, isn't it? Europe is an open continent. Uh, people are not checked at borders, are they? Well, I mean, that's been the case in Europe since the beginning of Schengen. I mean, yeah. there's, no, there's no border between countries that are a member of Schengen, obviously. Uh, but here the issue is to try what the Europeans are trying to do, especially the Italians, are trying to target very specific you know, clutters of, uh, of, of, the, uh, of rising um, presence of coronavirus. Uh, you've seen some, some clear move in northern Italy, with, uh, especially in, in, in Venezia or in Milano. Uh, you're seeing a series of, of any kind of of public gathering of above a thousand people are being cancelled already. Uh, others are actually, you know, seeing that the potential attendance really uh, lower uh, in in those cities. You don't have the kind of lockdown that we have seen in Wuhan, but obviously the efficiency of, of these uh, policies by the uh, by the Chinese administration has inspired somehow European leaders to try to implement this. Uh, on that level, the European countries are actually much better equipped to answer to uh, such a the rise of of, of cases than the, the American. Uh, society. I mean, when you look at, at Europe, there's actually a very strong, you know, uh, hospital system. Uh, almost every single citizen are covered by uh, Medicare for all, basically, in, in, uh, in, in Europe. So there will no, be, not be any temptation from anyone that is actually being affected by the virus not to go in hospitals and being double-checked. This is not the case in the U.S., mm -hmm. where you have a large size of the population that is uninsured, yeah. that don't trust the capacity of hospitals to actually, you know, uh, pay, pay very high-level bills. And the fact that the Trump administration has completely you know, uh, purge the, the, the systems that were put in place by the Obama administration. I'm yeah. actually much more worried by the American society than European countries today. Well, I mean, I, I want to agree that, uh, uh, that China's uh, aggressive policy is what has shown that has results. And I think the rest of the world is, uh, you know, well advised to learn from China, both its mistakes and its, its successes. And I think that's what is happening a little bit. The difference, as you pointed out, mm -hmm. and our colleague from, uh, from China, is that there is a, a different structure here, political structure. Right. I mean, it might be easier for China to actually impose a certain kind of quarantines than it is in Europe or the United States. Right. The second thing that I, I want to agree with is the issue of recession. I think we're definitely heading into a recession because yeah. even if this doesn't last that long, just what is happening in terms of disruptions in terms of the impact on various countries and various industries is going to outlast. Right. I think our first indication is going to be coming up soon with the labor statistics um, and, uh, sorry, the jobless uh, 
statistics. I mean, the U.S. economy did very well in the first two months of the year in terms of creation, job creation. However, uh, if, if that drops uh, in this coming... Um, the new figures will factor in this. Exactly, yeah. because it yeah. basically it will show you that there is a slowdown in right. terms of um, uh, companies expanding and hiring. Right. And so right. But the last point is, yeah. I think there is a limit to what governments this time can do to alleviate um, uh, the economic impact, because most of governments around the world mm -hmm. are heavily indebted, yep. not like before. And two, central banks, the, the, their main tool is, uh, is uh, interest rates. The interest rates yeah. are way down already. In the United States, is about 1%. Um, that I don't see how far can they go in terms of trying to create a, 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 a stimulate their economy. So, mm -hmm. so we are in a whole different territory. Right. I think historical precedents are not going to play very well here. All right, let me go to Anthony Chan. Anthony, we've just had a statement from the United States Treasury Secretary, uh, Steve Mnuchin. Let's listen to what he had to say. Our primary focus is there are parts of the economy that are going to be impacted, especially workers that need to be at home, hardworking people who are at home under quarantine or taking care of their family. We'll be working on a program to address that. We will also be working with small businesses who need liquidity through SBA programs. We're looking at alternatives at the IRS. We have large tax payments coming up of providing certain relief to, to companies and individuals for liquidity. So the president is 100% committed that uh, we will provide whatever tools we need, that the economy will be in very good shape a year from now. This is not like the financial crisis where we don't know the end in sight. This is about providing proper tools and liquidity to get through the next few months. So, Anthony, we hear the administration here talk a lot about uh, calming markets, uh, addressing economic uh, issues, uh, but they would also have to address the virus itself, wouldn't they? Oh, absolutely. I think uh, taking care of the public uh, health uh, issues is paramount, and that's something that certainly is going to have to be part of the equation for us to be able to survive this without a recession. Remember that the reason why most people say that we're going into a recession, because historically, when the stock market drops 20% or more, about 60% of the time you go into a recession. But we should not lose sight of the fact that in 2018, in December, the market dropped 19.8%. And many people were saying the same thing, that because it was almost 20%, we were definitely going into a recession. Of course, we did not. Now, when you look at the employment numbers for the first two months of the year, they're basically consistent with more than 3% growth in the first calendar quarter. I don't think we're going to get 3% growth. I think growth is going to be a lot weaker. But remember, you need to have this virus really persisting for another two additional quarters, that is the second and third quarters, to be able to generate negative growth, to be able to get that so-called technical definition of a so-called recession. And the last point I would make is that if you go back to every single president, all the way back to Calvin Coolidge, you've never really seen a, a situation where the person in the White House, Democrat or Republican, getting reelected if you are in a recession mm. in the two years going into the election. And I think they, they've heard that, they understand that message loud and clear in Washington. And it really doesn't matter whether a Democrat or Republican would be in there. I think they're going to do everything they can, whether it's payroll taxes, whether it's lowering taxes, whether it's spending more money, whether it's pressuring the Fed. And the Federal Reserve's tools are not just interest rates. I worked as a Federal Reserve economist at the New York Fed. I worked at the Washington Fed when Paul Volcker was there. Mm -hmm. And the world was different when I was an economist at the Fed. But today, it's not just interest rates. They can do asset purchases. Uh, already, you've seen some Federal Reserve officials talking about maybe having Congress changing some of the laws so they can actually buy other type of, of securities mm -hmm. that, again, would add the liquidity into the market. You take that in addition with all the progress that's being made on the medical side. It's almost like a medical arms race. Yes, we had the Spanish flu in 1918. Mm -hmm. Yes, it killed 50 million people. But during my lifetime, it took about 15 years, 10 to 15 years, to develop a vaccine. Today, everything is going at a much faster pace, whether it be developing antivirals, whether it be doing human trials a lot quicker. 
yeah. more experiment. So in short, I don't think this will last as long as those traditional right. uh, type of uh, viruses that we've seen in the past. Okay, Alfred, I'll get to you in a moment. I just want to get to Remy Pierre, uh, Eurozone uh, ministers, finance ministers will be meeting next week to decide on a stimulus plan. Uh, when they came under pressure in 2008, they had a 200 billion euro uh, extra spending. Uh, do, you, do you foresee the same thing happening this time? Well, what we've seen, we've been seeing over the last few years in Europe is, is an improvement in terms of, of encouraging for investment and maybe lowering a little bit the tone on, on, on rigorous policies and monetary policies in, uh, in Europe. And, and maybe the one country that was trying to oppose the rise of debt was Germany, and Germany is one of those countries that is facing the largest risks with the coronavirus outbreak, especially because of the impact that it will have on the capacity to continue exporting, you know, machine goods and, and other, other equipments. So as a result, it's likely that we're going to see a continuing of this trend towards, uh, as seen, like quantitative easings uh, policies from the federal bank, but also, as, as your former guest was mentioning, mm -hmm. you know, select uh, you know, asset purchase to maintain the economy on float. That's something that is much more into the DNA of the European economy than it is into the uh, Trump administration, which is supposed to be much more capitalistic and opposed to any kind of, you know, state position and, and, and uh, asset grabbing in, in the economy. So it's likely that we're going to see, you know, a, a clear consensus among finance ministers to try to support the economy, obviously. But it's going to have to take much more than that, some, you know, really out-of-the-box uh, uh, policies of, you know, investment in the economy, of trying to, you know, provide some clear certainty into the mm. mid to the long run uh, for consumers and investors. Because right now, everyone is stay, staying on the sidelines. Uh, you're seeing a series of companies like Flybe, uh, uh, which is an uh, uh, airline in, in the UK, just went bankrupt. Uh, Lufthansa has announced already a 25% decrease of its revenues over the last few, few months. And you're going to see this over and over again. So it's a question of really showing leadership and showing the capacity to implement some clear instruments into right. the European economy. Okay, Hafid, go ahead. No, I just thought that the link between what's happening, coronavirus, and the political mm -hmm. environment, especially in the United States, getting into an election is very yeah. important. Notice what uh, President Trump and also the uh, uh, Treasury Secretary were mentioning, you know, uh, Treasury Secretary saying a year from today things will be better, um, sort of to buy time to assure people that this is not going to impact the economy. I agree, they're going to do whatever they can to do it, um, and they're going to throw at it whatever money they can. The, the issue, again, is also about uh, the science, about what's going to happen to the virus. Yeah. So far, um, all indication and every uh, medical um, opinion I've, yeah. I've read says that they don't see, they, they, there is no foreseeable uh, vaccine, an immediate vaccine. And I think the impact of this is going to last at least for a uh, few months. Yeah, uh, there's going to be no vaccine for at least a year. And, exactly. that's, and that's being very optimistic. Exactly. And, and, you know, it's still making its round the, yeah. around the world. I right. mean, here in Washington, D.C., for example, we are told that the peak is going to happen in about three weeks, three to four weeks. Uh, so we're, we still haven't even yeah. reached that peak where, where uh, the infection plateaus. Yeah. Anna Tanga, there was an interesting comment I saw. It came from Mark Zandi, the chief economist at uh, Moody's Analytics, who said that businesses were already on edge uh, before COVID-19 because of the U.S.-China trade war, which he says did significant damage to the global economy. What do you make of that assessment? Well, he's absolutely correct. I mean, attacking your own supply chain is kind of uh, cutting off your nose to spite your face. Uh, this has been very evident. And, and frankly, the, the issue is this uncertainty that's been caused by a uh, you know, very, very different tactical uh, approach that Donald Trump takes to the rest of the world. But I mean, you know, this idea that somehow you can fight the new war with the tactics that were used in the old war, I think is incorrect. There has to be a little bit more creativity than thinking that the world is static. Quite frankly, 80% of the, the world's economy, especially in developed things, depends on choice. This idea that you choose what you want. Um, this is about not discretionary spending. And right now, the crisis that is being created is among those people who do not have the means to continue that. If you do not have that demand, you're going to see a quick downward spiral. Remember, manufacturing is a function of demand. It's not I make it, therefore people buy it. It is simply if I have the money, I choose what I intend to buy. 
And this seems to be being ignored by most of the groups out there. I'm also a little concerned about this minimization of this. Many of these countries that we've all conceded do not have the ability to uh, handle this the same way that China has. And it's not clear how they intend to do it. Saying that we're a month off the highs, that's uh, very, very optimistic if nothing is done to con control it. So at this point, I'm not very uh, assured by the kind of responses that uh, I've heard from my panel members. Right, Anthony Chan, uh, something else that we haven't talked about, of course, the world's economies are all integrated right now. We live in the age of globalization. Uh, we see this disruption of supply chains uh, starting in China. I mean, could this have a ripple effect affect Deve the developing world, we haven't talked about that and their ability to manage something like a coronavirus outbreak. Well, I think that at this uh, juncture with these supply chains, uh, these products have to be used in, mm -hmm. in the developed world. And yes, there's going to be a little bit of a diversification of those global supply chains. That's exactly what a, any risk averse business will do. But at the end of the day, uh, with, even with the low unemployment rates in the United States and many of the developing uh, countries, you're not going to be able to bring all that uh, production back on shore. You simply don't have the ability uh, to get that done. So, yes, diversification, but that doesn't mean that it's going to completely collapse. There's going to be some rearrangement uh, of those supply chains, but it will undoubtedly have uh, some implications. Maybe some of the, uh, uh, the strict dependence on China will will push out into other countries, Vietnam, Thailand, Singapore, Malaysia, other countries, India. But that doesn't mean that it's going to come back all back uh, yeah. to the United States. By, all, by no means is that going to happen. Have a go. Very quickly, I've got 30 seconds. Uh, I mean, we see in Italy uh, gatherings, outdoor gatherings have been, uh, well, they've been banned, really, throughout right. the country. Um, <coughs> here in the United States, we had the South by Southwest Festival in Austin, Texas, a yeah. very big festival. That's yeah. been canceled. The IMF World Bank right? conference, yeah. the first time that I can remember. But the big event canceled. of 2020 is the Summer Olympics in Japan. Correct. Is that under threat? Yeah, probably, yes. Uh, there is also countries like, for example, the UAE, Dubai, uh, has planned for, I think, the end of the summer, the uh, 2020 World um, Fair. Mm -hmm. And they've invested enormous amount of money in it. Um, they even borrowed. Um, and now it looks, uh, they were expecting about three to four million visitors for that. Yeah, in fact, Dubai is saying that its future depends on that. Exactly, yeah. it is. I yeah. mean, for, for, a, for a place like Dubai. Yeah. Uh, also, the, the one thing I would also want to uh, uh, yeah. alert you to is there is okay. the, the consumer... Uh, confidence right. index that's coming up. I think that will also let us know well, about the future. We will of take a look at that. <laughs> we have run out of time. Thanks to all of you. That's it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Arnand Naidu. Thanks for watching. Thank you. Sorry. Hello everybody, I'm Arnand Naidu. If you enjoy the thoughtful, engaged discussions you see on The Heat, you may also want to subscribe to our podcast. It's appropriately titled The Heat. Twice a week we take a deep dive on world headlines, talking to experts, journalists and others. It's a fresh, focused and intimate look at the issues that matter most. Whether it's the Hong Kong riots, the latest Middle East conflict or US politics, The Heat podcast gives the clear context needed to understand both what's going on and why. And what's best, we come to you. Whether you're at home or on the go, you can find The Heat Podcast just about anywhere podcasts are found. Just search The Heat CGTN. Have a listen today and subscribe. Thanks.